Well, we've defined property alpha. Here's the definition for finite sets. It doesn't even have to be for finite sets, but we said for finite sets, if, if a choice function, if something that looks at everything in this big set X, looks at all the possibilities in the big set X, and, and subsets of possibilities, and assigns what is chosen in every possible subset that can be in this big, subs, in this big set X, Suppose the choice function, suppose that choice function, again, we're talking about finite sets of choices. Suppose that choice function obeys property alpha. Well, then that choice function is rationalizable. And if any choice function is rationalizable, then it must follow property alpha. It's a necessary condition and it's a sufficient condition. Okay, well, we haven't proved that. I'd have to prove it's necessary and sufficient. I'm just going to focus on one of them, taking it from the Osborne Rubinstein book. Let me first remind you what rationalizability, uh, sorry, rationalizing a choice function is. Well, I said it in words. Let's say it a little bit more in equational symbols, uh, mathematical symbols. So what is it rationalizing a choice function? What does it mean that some preference relation, which we usually express in terms of weak preference, what does it mean that that rationalizes a choice function? What does it mean that a choice function can be rationalized? It means that there's some preference relation such that this will always be the case. Whenever that choice function is applied to some subset of choices within the big X, right? We'll talk about an A within the choice set over which this choice function operates, the set over which this function operates. Whenever it chooses an X1, but an X2 was also in that choice set, was any other element within that choice set A? Well, it must be that X1 was strictly preferred by X to X2 by the choice, by the preference relation that rationalizes this choice function. There must be some preference relation. I can ascribe that for any choice made, the element chosen is strictly preferred to any other element in the set. And then we say that the choice function is rationalizable. And we have examples both of ones that are and are not rationalizable. Okay, well, how do we know that if the choice function, if C is rationalizable how do we know that if it's rationalizable then it must as long as we're talking about finite sets then it must obey property alpha if it's in if we're talking about choices over a finite set well here's a pretty simple proof all right of that direction and it's just coming from Osborne and Rubenstein but I'll talk you through it maybe helps to have have someone talk you through it to follow what each step means and, and how it how it implies but you know the challenge here is keeping a lot of things in your head at the same time that's why it's so important to try to simplify whenever we can whenever we can simplify without a loss of generality we try to do so otherwise it's too much to keep in our head all right, every proposition 2-1, rationalizable choice functions must satisfy property alpha. All right, well, let's, tr let's see what's going on here. So let C be a rationalizable choice function. All right, so let's say suppose C, suppose, and I sort of put in uh, blue when I'm talking about suppose, all right? Let me make that a convention. When I'm talking about suppose. Sometimes supposes are just definitional. Sometimes supposes are, let's try out what if the following is the case. So here, there's a mix of the two. Suppose, suppose C is rationalizable 
a rationalizable choice function. All right, let's let's see. Does it ha if it's rationalizable, does it have to follow property alpha? And then if it's rationalizable, it must be that there's some preference relation here. We just circled it. If it's rationalizable, it must be that there's some preference relation such that for all sets, sets A, for all sets A within the big set of choices that this choice function operates over, including the full choice set, including the big, big set X itself, right? Everything together. It must be that there's some preference relation, the one that rationalizes this, this choice function, it must be that there's some preference relation such that C of A, the choice made for every subset of X is the best, best according to this guy, according to this preference relation. Okay, just as I, just as I was talking about right here. All right, and now let's assume as we did for the, de the same notation as we used for the definition of property alpha, let's let, let us assume that B, and the word I meant to say was proper subset. B is a proper subset of A. A has some things that are not in B, but every element of B is in A. Suppose B is this proper subset of A. Okay. Now, suppose that, now this is just notation because the choice has to be something, right? Well, now suppose, but, that, but hold on, this is not just an assumption. Let's suppose that the choice made, or the choice that the choice function states, which is the, we think of that as the choice made, the choice made in the larger set happens to also be contained in the smaller set, right? So when we're offered the salmon steak and the uh, snails, the choice made is also the choice that's made when we're just offered the salmon and the steak, right? Suppose that the choice made in this larger set Let's call this, this A is the big square, B is the smaller square. Suppose this was chosen when we're talking about the big set A. Here, I'll draw it in red, okay? So the big set A is the red box. And suppose we chose something that's also available in the smaller box, when in the smaller box, which is, which is the choice set B. All right? But now... Since the choice made in this larger choice set, we know that because of what I just said, the choice made in the larger choice set must be at least as good as any other choice uh, for any other choice in that same choice set for all Y in A. If that if that weren't the case, then it wouldn't be justified by this by the rationalized by these preferences. We have that the choice the choice made whatever was chosen in this larger set must also be at least as good as any y in the smaller set. How do I know that? Well, the well, if the choice is the best choice in the larger set, if it's better than anything in the larger set, there's nothing new in the smaller set that could be better than it. So if it's the greatest of all these four, it's also the greatest among these two. Or if it's greater than or equal to anything of these four, 
It's also greater than or equal to any of these two. All right, which means that if, again, if this preferences are justifying the choice, must be that whatever is chosen in A must be the same thing as whatever is chosen in B. Because if this is justifying the choice, you choose whatever is greatest according to this preference relation. And whatever is greatest according to this preference relation is, in this case, if it's available in both the larger and smaller sets, it must be that it's the greatest in both the larger and the smaller sets. Thus, the choice must be the same in both sets. And this was just our def this just gets us to our definition, just gets us to our definition of property alpha for all sets A and B, where I, I erased that bit there, where A is strictly in B, which is strict, which is sorry, proper subset of B, which is just a subset of X, could be the whole set itself. If the choice of A is in B, it must be that uh, the choice of B is the same as the choice of A. And how did we prove it? Well, we just said, look, if it's the best thing in A, if it's, just, if it's justified by these preferences, it must be judged as best by these preferences in A. Well, if, it's the, if it gets the great highest rating, if it's the greatest thing in, in set A, it must be the greatest thing in a smaller set. Boom. Pretty obvious. You might have been there long before I was.